Well, thank you for being here. And uh, listen, I can't tell you the honor it is for me personally to be back with some of my colleagues from the Freedom Caucus. I have absolutely the most, utmost respect and love for these who are here and those who they represent in the Freedom Caucus. They really are the, in so many ways, the backbone of our entire conservative movement in Washington and as a result throughout our country. So let me introduce, on the far end, we have Byron Donalds. He's from Florida. <laughs> Got a few fans around here, Byron. He's uh, uh, from Florida's 19th district, a tremendous leader. I was just telling someone, Byron is a master of going on the adversarial news. He was on M MSNBC last night. He goes in there and does a phenomenal job getting our voice out. He's on the oversight committee as well as the financial services. Uh, next to him, Chip Roy from Texas. Chip, is, uh, he, he heads up the policy for, uh, leads the policy discussion in uh, Freedom Caucus. He's also on the Judiciary, the Budget, and the Critical Rules Committee. Of course, formerly the Chief of Staff for Senator Cruz and Assistant AG for the State of Texas. So, uh, Chip, great to have you. And then Mary Miller, she was with us last night. Mary's from the 15th District of Illinois and uh, serves on the Ag Committee as well as Education and Workforce. Uh, Mary is a master at family issues, life issues, all of these are, but Mary is here because of those reasons and the battles that she has been, been involved with, with uh, regarding family. So welcome each of you. Uh, we've got several things that we want to cover. Let's begin with the obvious elephant in the room as you come back. To Congress right now, we have a potential government shutdown in the making of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, yes, we're all better when the government shuts down, aren't we? <laughs> Freedom Caucus has basically said at least five things must be included if a uh, shutdown is to be avoided. Everything from dealing with the weaponization to the wokeness issues, the spending levels, border all right, so I'm just going to kind of open this up to all of you to jump in here. What are the issues at stake? Are we going to have a shutdown? What are the, the issues the Freedom Caucus absolutely is not going to budge on? Yeah, well, uh, I think the, the issue really at stake is the Senate. The Senate and the White House, they have a view that everything is hunky-dory with the way the federal government is operating, and there should be no changes whatsoever. They passed this massive omnibus spending deal right before Christmas in the lame duck session uh, when we took back the House majority. They did that with Nancy Pelosi. And I say the Senate because you have Democrat and Republican senators who agreed to that. Members of the House never agreed to that, and we never wanted that package to go forward, but that's what they did. Well, now that we're in the same place again, we've been very clear with the Senate for quite some time, there have to be substantive changes. Add also to that. We are now projected to have a $2 trillion deficit, $2 trillion, when we are not in any hot war or, frankly, any military conflict around the globe. And at the same time, the pandemic has long been over. So if you're running $2 trillion deficit, Fitz ratings just downgraded our debt, there have to be some substantive changes. The Senate's position is clean, continuing resolution and funding the government even more than what we funded it last year. It just simply doesn't make any sense. And so if there's going to be a shutdown, it's because the Senate is going to create one. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Byron's got the uh, dynamic uh, down very clearly, and I think you all get that in terms of the Senate and the White House. Um, I think it's really critical to understand that what we've tried to do as the Freedom Caucus and a broader block of conservatives in the House of Representatives is to lay out what we believe are the critical issues that we must address, like Jody was talking about. Uh, we were making very clear about the overall spending level still must be addressed. $2 trillion of deficit spending when your $32 trillion of debt is completely unsustainable and it's not something that we can continue. Number two, you can't continue to have a Department of Defense that is more focused on being woke and involved in social engineering than it is on mission first in defending the United States of America. Um, the 
third thing you cannot do is continue to allow, as a Christian nation, a wide open border that is endangering American citizens through fentanyl poisonings <laughs> and through human trafficking and sex trafficking that is harming immigrants in the name of false name of compassion. Fourth, you cannot allow the Department of Justice continue to be weaponized against the president, former president of the United States and against the American people. And, and I'd say fifth, uh, we, we cannot continue to have a blank check going to Ukraine without dealing with what we need to do here at home first. Now, I would add a sixth element to that, which is I think we also need to deal with making sure we no longer prolong and continue the COVID tyranny nonsense and the mask mandates and vaccine mandates. But, but, but I do want to say, we, and this is important for the fight coming in October, and then I'll stop and turn it over, which is we cannot go down the road of a Christmas tree wish list when it comes to the fight that we're going to have in October. And Jody knows this full well. And my colleagues here know this full well. We're going to have to centralize the fight. When you have a shutdown, which are almost as inevitably going to be because the Senate and the White House has no interest in standing up and defending you all and your interest in this country's interest, they're only interested in advancing radical leftist ideology, we have to hold the line. And to hold the line, we got to have a centralized message. We got to constrain spending and do our job to make sure the troops are funded to do their job, and we got to secure the border of the United States. And that's going to be a centralized theme as we head into October. Excellent. Well, I couldn't say it better than they said, but I do want to tell you, this is why I belong to the Freedom Caucus. I'm not saying there aren't fighters outside of the Freedom Caucus, but I can tell you that all the members of the Freedom Caucus are fighters. You all don't elect members to come out here to be passive placeholders, and our votes count for something. We need to use our leverage to move legislation forward that impacts the American people in a positive way. No more of this passive placeholding. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, so all of these, I don't think there's a person in here that would disagree with any of these five or six issues that you're standing for. The, the question is, how many of these are we going to be able to win? As, as standing, I mean, even these issues, are there... Is there a willingness within the Freedom Caucus primarily, because they hold the leverage with the th slim majority that we have, is there a willingness to compromise any of these? Which ones? I mean, what, what is the line in the sand? We will not go beyond this issue. You want to go on? I'll start on this one, then you, you back clean up on this one, which is, um, look, we can't get everything we're going to want, right. okay? I, I'm not going to start with the defeatist point. position, yeah. right? But, but what, what you have to remember is, and, and, my, and our friend Thomas Massey tweeted something out this morning reminding us that we have one half of one third of the federal government. And in our having one half of one third, with now Steve Scalise battling cancer, with a retirement yesterday by Chris Stewart, we have a razor thin majority in the House. So we have to find a way to leverage that to get something for the American people. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, if 99% of Republicans agree, uh, we're still a little short. And that's, that's the reality, right, in terms of where we are in forcing change. So we're trying to get a unity of 218. I would answer the question like this. We have to hold the line and demand change and pick an, an issue that we're going to change. If you look at what we've got right now, what we got out of the speaker's fight with conservatives on the Rules Committee, conservatives at the leadership table, conservatives on the Appropriations Committee. We now have a Department of Defense bill, which while it's spending at a level I would prefer be lower, it, has, it, it gets rid of the abortion tourism language, it gets rid of the transgender surgeries, it gets rid of the chief diversity officers, it gets rid of a lot of the stuff out of the defense bill. We should applaud that, right? The Republican conference is moving in the direction we're pushing. So we've got to take that, leverage it, try to get the defense bill across the line, and in my opinion, and I think Byron agrees, and I think Mary probably agrees, we've got to stand up and say that no more open borders. It is destroying our country, it is destroying the rule of law, and we've got to get that done. I, I would add to that and say, um, it's been reported in the press now, we've been asked questions about it on the Hill. Uh, a handful of us have been in negotiations with other members of the Republican conference on the other side of our conference to try to find that, that cohesive agreement amongst us as Republicans overall that we can stand for. Um, in my view, border security is that issue. What is, ha <clears throat> what is happening in the country right now? 
there was a protest rally in Staten Island, New York, over the migrant crisis in New York City. You have a difference of opinion that is basically a Cold War difference, which could become a hot war difference, depending on what happens between the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, and the White House. You have a president of the United States who is too busy taking too many naps and has no control over the bully pulpit whatsoever. And I would add, his staff does not want him to have the bully pulpit. They want to keep him away from everybody and away from the press. Um, at the end of the day, power kind of does a pour a vacuum. And there is a real opportunity in this vacuum of lack of leadership in the United States where uh, 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 a key strong position on border security by House Republicans gives us an, a, a new leverage piece in the, in the light of the fact that Joe Biden is just simply terrible at his job and has no ability to stand in front of the American people and explain his position for why the southern border is what it is. He cannot do that. Kamala Harris cannot do that. Corinne Jean-Pierre cannot do that. And even the press can't do it, because in the streets of New York, the reporters are stepping over migrants sleeping in the streets on their way to their cushy, stu their cushy studios to report the news. So that gives us an opportunity to really engage in that, but Republicans have to be unified. And, and that's why I'm saying we have members who are engaged in those negotiations to bring that compromise. So whether you're a member from New York, a member from California, a member from Texas or Illinois or Florida, we say this is the thing, border security, that must be achieved. Okay. So it sounds like the, the border issue is probably going to be the place that, that the major battlegrounds, and we're going to continue fighting for these other issues as well, but the border is going to kind of the line in the sand over the, the spending, is it, that correct? It is. And can I just add one more piece on the border security, which I think is really important, particularly for this audience and this organization. As a Texan, okay, I just want to speak here as a Christian. We cannot, as a Christian nation, allow what is occurring to both our children and migrant children in the false name of compassion to continue. We cannot do it. I am telling you as we speak, I represent San Antonio, I-35 coming up from the Rio Grande Valley, I-10 cutting across the country. There are stash houses in San Antonio, stash houses in Texas, where little girls are getting sold into the sex trafficking trade while we're sitting here. It's happening. We know it's happening. We cannot continue to allow that to occur. It is endangering our people and endangering our society and communities with fentanyl poisonings and cartels and violence and empowering China. But it is also, and this is so critically important, fueling the kinds of things that you saw in the movie, The Sound of Freedom. And if you haven't seen The Sound of Freedom, you should. We cannot allow that to continue on our watch. And as Christians, we must stand up and demand that it ends. Okay, let's, uh, I, want, I want to get to some other things as well, but one other huge issue that everyone in this room and watching our viewers right now as well, the impeachment inquiry that is now underway, uh, we would be remiss to not address that and get your thoughts on where this is headed. Uh, this is vastly different from the impeachments of President Trump that basically involved a phone call and so forth. We know that this is a, a mounting um, uh, pile of evidence. Give us your thoughts on where this is going to go. Um, well, this is not political. And yesterday, Jamie Comer, who's the head of oversight, said we could go to the oversight uh, website and see that there's right now 22 uh, pieces of evidence against uh, Joe Biden and the impeachment trial or the impeachment process will unfold much more that we know is coming so yeah i think um mary nailed it and, and that, that you know this idea from the left out there in the press and and from our colleagues and utterly you know utter hypocrisy uh in terms of how they're handling this let's be very clear and you guys may not even know this the oversight committee has to operate in the context when it is operating without a department of justice that's helping right the department of justice is totally ignoring this they're targeting president trump they're targeting scott smith in loudon county they're targeting mark halk in philadelphia but they're not going to go look at joe biden 
Notwithstanding the fact that we know there's 10 to $15 million that have flowed through Hunter Biden, we know that it's gone to the Biden family, we know that there are shell corporations, we know that there are witnesses that have come forward now and said, hey, we know that Joe Biden was actually fully knowledgeable of what the business associates of Hunter Biden were doing. We know this money was coming from Ukraine and China. We know that there's uh, blatant corruption going on. And DOJ won't enforce it. So the Oversight Committee has had to use what we call our legislative purpose oversight, which has limited uh, reach. Now with an impeachment inquiry, the Oversight Committee now has extended reach, reach that the courts can recognize. So with that inquiry, you can then go pursue, where did that money go? And when I've got all these leftists, you know, uh, in the media who come up and ask, well, don't, why are you going down this road? Isn't this political? I say, well, it's not political. And look, and I, I totally shun this idea. Some people said, oh, well, you know, the funding fight needs to be connected to whether or not you're doing an impeachment inquiry. No, it doesn't. Those are separate things. We have an obligation and a duty to do our impeachment inquiry because we have to defend the rule of law in the face of the absence of the rule of law from the Department of Justice. Jamie Comer should be applauded. Jim Jordan should be applauded. But we need to step on the gas. We need to get the evidence, and we need to demonstrate it to the American people. So, uh, you know, being on oversight, uh, first of all, Chairman Comer, Jamie Comer, has done a fun, he's done a fantastic job on this. Chip is 100% right. He should be applauded. Um, he really should be. Because coming in, one of our first meetings was about suspicious activity reports at the Department of Treasury. Folks, I want to be, want to re, I've, I, don't, I say this sometimes, but not enough. There are suspicious activity reports that are sent from every financial institution to the Department of Treasury. Every, under every presidential administration, Congress has had full ability to go to Treasury, request those documents, and read those documents in full until Joe Biden became President of the United States. He is the first president who decided to change the Department of Treasury internal regulations that would block Congress from viewing these reports. Even Maxine Waters threw a, threw a hissy fit over this for a short amount of time that she got back in line, Joe, that she got back in line. But she threw a fit about it initially because this had never occurred. Donald Trump did not block Congress's ability. Barack Obama did not block Congress's ability. George W. Bush did not block Congress's ability, but Joe Biden did the second he became president of the United States. That is the first thing that begged us to, begged us to ask this simple question. What do you have to hide? And from that point going forward, we have followed the evidence. Like we know that we have members and voters in the Republican base who wanna see impeachment happen four months ago. But the thing we have to respect is the actual process of the House and actually the institution of the House of Representatives. What Nancy Pelosi did was damaging to the Republic and it was damaging to the stature of the House of Representatives. A true process is letting the evidence speak for itself. That's what we've been doing. Impeachment inquiry like Chip and like Mary say is gonna expand our powers. Where does this go? I firmly believe having seen been in knee deep in these investigations now that they on purpose set up a public corruption scheme to hide Joe Biden while collecting millions of dollars in the process. I personally think you're not gonna see a check written to Joe Biden, but what I think you're gonna see are areas where Joe Biden was basically having his bills paid and he was luxuriating off of the fact that he allowed his son to sell access to his office. And I also believe that did not stop when he was vice president. It continued on into the early days of his presidency. Wow, it's gonna be interesting to watch that. One, one question that I have, and of course, Byron, you and I served on oversight together, and we saw this issue time and again, and I'm sure you're seeing it even more, each of you are, but now that the indictments are coming forward for Hunter, how much of that is going to be used by the Department of Justice to say, oh, we now have an investigation underway so we cannot cooperate because we have our investigation going under. Uh, how, how do you get around this? Does this impeachment inquiry go beyond the jurisdictions uh, of, of that type of scenario or are they going to use it to obstruct you from getting the information you need. Well, well real quick, I, th I think to quote our, all, our good friend Mark Levin, the Department of Justice is really the Department of Injustice. 
they have been obstructing justice over at DOJ. They have been blocking and tackling for Hunter and Joe for six years now. This has been going on. So this is not a new phenomenon because we've retaken the House. They've been blocking and tackling for a long time. I personally believe at this point that the impeachment inquiry has the ability to step over the indictment. Now it's the gun charge indictment with respect to Hunter Biden because our focus has nothing to do with the gun charge. Our focus is on the financial ties between Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and I will also add Jim Biden, the president's brother, because he's involved in this too. He just never gets talked about. So there, these are financial ties between those three and other members of the Biden family. That, in my view, has nothing to do with the indictment that came out the other day from the Department of Justice. There's one thing that uh, the Department of Justice, in my view, should definitely be looking at, and that is the fact that Hunter Biden violated FARA. The Foreign Agents Registration Act, he violated that very, very clearly. He did not register very, very clearly. But I don't believe the Department of Justice is going to get into that because if they get into that, now the question becomes, did Joe Biden know and help to facilitate his son representing foreign interests by letting him ride on Air Force Two everywhere that he went? All right, Chip. I, I would only add, because we got other issues we want to cover, I know. Um, in just short order, this is why, again, we should applaud Jamie, because they, they, they took the time while they could to go get the information necessary without getting trapped by going too far and forcing and trying to go pursue bank records where you're then litigating it in court. By doing that, we were able to get whistleblower testimony, get some of the stuff. We now know the email pseudonyms. We now had Devin Archer come forward. We've made and laid the foundation. So now you can proceed with the impeachment inquiry to have greater tools, which allows you to get farther into it, notwithstanding some of the arguments they're going to try to get to, to obfuscate. So you would agree with Byron that they're not going to be able to use the Hunter Biden investigation to obstruct? Well, they will try. They will try. And, 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 you know, courts are courts that we got to deal with. But, but we're in a better posture now than we would have been had we taken a different path. Okay. All right, let's shift gears if we can. I think those are the two big issues that are dominating the news as it relates to the battles that are currently going. There are so many other things. I, I tell you, you all have so many plates spinning right now. We need to be in prayer for our members of Congress and this group in particular, so many issues. But one thing I think that, that many in this room and around the country are concerned about is in the midst of so many big issues like we have just now been discussing are dominating the news. It seems in the midst of the smoke behind the scenes, this administration continues to undermine marriage, to push abortion, to destroy parental rights, to indoctrinate our children. And all those, these things are, are making the news. They seem to kind of be going under, under current in the midst of it all. So let's transition to talk a little bit about these issues as well. Um, Mary, let me begin with you. You just started the uh, marriage caucus, the family caucus uh, recently. Why did you start that? What are the goals that you hope will be accomplished? Okay, so I personally believe that we're in the midst of an attempted revolution on our country. The Marxists are, you know, they're in infiltrated in every institution and in our state, so it's not just Joe Biden. And they're going after the foundations of our country, and that is faith and family. And I was thinking how, because my husband and I are farmers, how important infrastructure is for us to get our product out. And the infrastructure for our faith is the family. That is how we um, pass our uh, faith and our patriotism on to the next generation. And that's why there is such a concerted attack on the family. So I did just start the Congressional Family Caucus to stand up for all things family. So, you know, to fight the pro-life issue, uh, to fight against um, bad legislation that, for example, the welfare program that is basically promoting fatherlessness, um, uh, unjust legislation that rewards people to not get married when they're living together and have children, um, you know, anything with education and um, just to stand up for um, the marriage as God defined it a man and a woman with their children committed to each other for life. Amen. Yeah, 
Right. So this is one thing where, again, we tend to get somewhat despondent about the state of things, and it's, and it's understandable, right? I get just as cynical about it. But I do want to, again, focus on some of the rays of hope. With what we did in January in changing the institution of the House of Representatives, getting, as I have talked about earlier, more conservatives in some of these important committees, now we've got actual changes to policies that would never have been done before. And a national, now, we haven't implemented them yet. We've got to get them to the Senate and the White House. I'm not going to get too Pollyanna here. But, but, but we managed to get a National Defense Authorization Act passed in July that included in it a ban on the abortion tourism language, that included in it a ban on the transgender surgeries that are being funded to the Department of Defense, a ban, as I explained earlier, on the chief diversity officers, the DEI, the critical race theory, all of the things that are the war on our culture. That's a really significant thing. We were also able to get, I think, in 11 of the 12 appropriations bills that were reported out of committee, language that I'd been advocating for to say that no federal funds can be used to target you for your Christian faith and belief in traditional marriage. And that includes adoption agencies and so forth. So that is critical language that this Republican conference, we've been able to, through our work, to get embedded in these important bills. As I said, the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill that we're currently trying to get off the House floor, if we can figure out a total plan, has important and critical protections against this assault on our values. We are miles away from where we need to go, but we're winning this inch by inch. I understand that if you have the Titanic rolling at the, the iceberg, you wanna, you wanna get in there and turn that wheel. We're in there turning it. We'll all just pray hard that we'll turn it fast enough, but just know, like rest easy and take heart in the fact we are moving the needle. And those fights that we are fighting, they are changing hearts and minds in the Republican conference and in, in, and in Washington and hopefully in the country. Great. Wow. The only thing I would add to this is that we wouldn't be in this position if you guys weren't fervent in your desire to see change in this nation. If the families, if the church could, had continued, in my view, to put its head in the sand and not respond to this stuff, we would have no ability to do what we're doing up here on Capitol Hill. The second thing I would say is these uh, culture issues, which the left always accuses us of starting culture wars, the truth is they are the ones that start culture wars and we respond to the, offense, the offensive nature of their, of their acts. The response now is gone beyond party lines in my view. This is now a response where you have Muslim men, you have black men, you have Hispanic men who are looking at this and saying they want no parts of this. They want their children to be left alone. They do not want the seepage of indoctrination in our schools. They actually see the true value of families. Um, and now there, there's even this subtle movement amongst young women now where they're looking at some of the radicalism associated with the, femi with the feminism movement and saying, wait a minute, actually, Having family and having a husband and having children is a good thing for quality life and the future of our economy and the future of, of our country. These are all positive developments, but it's not possible without you guys standing firm and talking to your friends and your, and your fellow uh, parishioners and congregants and saying, there is nothing wrong with standing firm on the things that we believe. I tell people all the time, you could pray all day, but my Bible says faith without works is dead. It takes both. Well, I did my part on that. It, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm the mom of seven when we just had our 20th grandchild. Woo! 20. Amazing. Uh, and let me, let me just underscore this. I think everyone in here needs to be encouraged with what you've just heard. The, the news is not going to report the battles for these cultural issues that are taking place and that we are seeing incremental victories on, but you need to be aware of this. So we have fighters in Congress, and the, the needle is moving on some of these issues. Chip, let me direct this directly to you because you, you may be in the best position to deal with it. I'm sure you're aware of what's happening in Finland. You have the... Pivy resigning case and all this sort of stuff where uh, parliament uh, members, parliamentarians actually being charged with hate speech for defending marriage. Uh, is what happens in Europe a threat and a potential to happen here in America? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Jody. And we get asked about this a lot. Like, why are you focusing on something that's happening in Finland, right? Why is that something on your radar screen? Because what you're seeing there is coming to a theater near you very soon. If we don't stand up on the bedrock principles of freedom and faith and what built this country, and importantly on our free speech rights and our rights to assemble and our rights to carry out our, our uh, full expression of our faith. So it is instructive to see what's happening in Finland. And if you don't know about it, most of you probably do because FRC has been right at the center of this fight. I've done joint op-eds with Tony. Uh, we've been out there you know, hitting it on radio and TV. Um, and it's, it's a travesty, right? I mean, you've got a member of parliament for literally just standing up for her belief, uh, passing out literature, you know, saying that she believes in traditional marriage, she's being prosecuted. Think about that, prosecuted for a crime. People ask me why I vote against things, take tough votes, why many of us take tough votes, right? I mean, I voted against a bill in honor of Emmett Till, and that was brutal. It was a brutal vote because it had elements of hate crime in there. Now, I understand we can have differences of opinion on it. My point is, when you venture into hate crimes, no matter what the genesis of it, when you venture into hate crimes, you are now empowering the government to determine what is in your head, and now they're going to prosecute you for thought. That is something we have to stand athwart. And in this case, in your religious views, that's why we're offering these amendments to try to put them in appropriations bills and so forth. But let me just say as a positive, Pivey is a hero. She's not backing down. She's standing up. We're all children of God, and yes, I'm a, a pro-American nationalist wanting to make sure our country is strong, but I care about a Christian being persecuted across the ocean. She's a hero. She gives you hope. She gives you a belief that we can stand up and stand athwart that kind of tyranny. Riley Gaines in this country gives you hope that you can stand up against tyranny. If you don't know Chloe Cole, the young woman who has testified in front of our committee and she's detransitioning after having the forced transition upon her, she's a hero. Scott Smith in Loudoun County is a hero for standing up against the school board and the tyrants in Virginia. These are the people and you all standing on that wall. You have to keep standing on that wall and we'll stand right there alongside you. Outstanding. All right, we've, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and this is a key, though. It is pray, vote, stand. It's all of this combined. Byron, let me come to you, because uh, it, it, the, the thought came to me with this FACE Act, supposedly is to protect both the abortion business and the pro-life clinics and churches, uh, but we are seeing it really be used to target pro-life uh, clinics and churches and so forth. I mean, we have over 100 churches targeted, nothing being done, while the slightest little thing that's done to an abortion clinic, I mean, it, you'd think the sky is falling down. Are we going to be able to turn the corner? And Mary, I'd like to get your response on this as well from the Department of Justice. I, I think we can, but it starts with two things. First is we have to have a, we have to have a change of, of presidential administration. That goes without saying. And let me be very clear on this one. Chip and I, we, work, we are friends, we work together. We have a difference of opinion in a presidential. Y'all are gonna see that later today. We understand that. When this business is done in our presidential primaries, we have to be one party. One party focused on winning, period. The second thing is, the next attorney general, the job is going to be to completely clean out the political ranks at Maine Justice and the FBI. True accountability must come to the Department of Justice. Listen, wrongdoing must be prosecuted across the board. It cannot have a different face depending on the, 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 the party or the ideology you ascribe to. Because if that becomes the case, the entire rule of, rule of law will fall apart and we will lose the republic that we all love. So let's go win the White House, and then whoever becomes AG, mission one for that person is to clean out the political ranks at Maine Justice so we can have true justice in America. Good deal. Mary? Well, I'd like to pivot a little from the federal government to the importance of local uh, off opportunities, whether you know it's in the home, in the church, people that run for local offices. I think sometimes it's the, the importance of local 
offices is diminished, but it's very important who your mayor and sheriff, your uh, county board is, um, who your uh, regional superintendent of school, uh, DAs, all of those are very important. I think we should look for good candidates to fill those spots and be very supportive. All right. It, Jody, yeah, I just yeah, want to yeah, say one quick. thing. And I totally agree. I think the uh, ballot is inverted. I think local elections should be on top and it should go all the way down and we should be at the bottom in the Senate and the president down at the bottom. That's, that's the actual importance in a federalist system. One thing on the FACE Act, just know this, it's 130 to three. 130 times the FACE Act has been used against pro-lifers, right. three times for a church. I introduced legislation last week to fully repeal the FACE Act and we'll try to work on it. Yeah, I mean, that's the issue and that's gonna have to be resolved. Um, let me just say to y'all, thank you. Um, I miss being in the battle with you, but I thank God that you are still in the battle. And we pray for you like you don't know. Well, you're still in and, the battle with us. Hey, I know. You're not. I know. I, I know I'm, the, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying otherwise, but being in the battle with y'all day after day after day. And um, we are extremely grateful. FRC wants to provide a voice for you to get out in the midst of a cancel culture, we're putting together a system that will enable your voice to continue regardless of what happens. I wanna encourage each of you to pray for this group, the Freedom Caucus, and there are others who are not part of the Freedom Caucus, but this group primarily is the one standing, fighting, taking the shots day after day after day. So if you are able, I'm gonna ask you to stand and express your appreciation for these three here and the Freedom Caucus.